Perfect. All right, brothers and sisters, welcome, welcome. We are so glad to, to be together with you this evening. Um, tonight's fireside is hosted uh, by the Stand Independent Work Group. And we have been uh, laboring together for, oh, about the last year or so, a little over a year. Um, and and uh, striving and struggling to know what the Lord's will is concerning uh, preparation uh, of this people for what he calls, uh, uh, oh, what does he call it? Challenging times uh, soon to be upon you, or trying times. Is that what he says? Trying times, I think. And I think probably if we took a, a survey of those of us on this uh, fireside Zoom, probably a high percentage of us would all agree that probably those trying times that the Lord makes mention of in the covenant uh, probably are already upon us. Probably, probably already upon us and uh, will become more and more trying and more challenging as we move forward. So this is important stuff we're talking about. And Re or, uh, uh, McKay is going to help us to understand how what we're doing and where we're heading together as a people uh, is different and set apart from uh, those that we all refer to as preppers. We are not preppers. <laughs> and we don't ever want to be preppers. A couple of announcements before we uh, turn this thing over to McKay. Uh, the fireside is being recorded so that you know and you can let those uh, who you may know are interested know as well. There is a recording of this being made. Uh, so that will be available afterwards. Um, the second announcement, please perk up your ears. We are looking for a couple of volunteers to lead uh, the discussion on two future uh, firesides. These firesides will be monthly, one a month. And we are looking for uh, volunteers who are expert in number one, canning, and number two, uh, dehydrating. A couple of experts who, who would be willing to lead the discussion on a couple of upcoming firesides uh, on those two topics. So uh, if you would if you feel that you have a particular expertise in either canning or in dehydrating uh, of foods, uh, please volunteer and lead a discussion uh, on, on one of the next upcoming uh, firesides for us. All right. Um, Let's see, with that, we will turn the time over to Melody uh, Fawcett. Melody and Terry uh, Fawcett are heading up uh, the planning and organizing of the conference that will be held in September uh, that will focus on this general theme of preparation. So with that, Melody, we will turn it over to you. Okay, well, because we this is such an important time right now, because things are getting bad in the world, and we really need to be prepared, um, especially if our focus is on Zion, we need to have supplies on hand. And so that's why, um, after being warned that we need to get busy and labor, this um, having these firesides every month working up to the um, conference will be encouraging everyone to get 
get your supplies, get your food, you know, learn how to preserve and store it. And then um, our focus on the conference is going to be on to stand independent, being prepared, because if you are prepared, you need not fear. And that's from the Lord. And if, if none of us, I, I don't like being fearful. And so being prepared is going to give us the calm. The Lord promises that he will take care of us if we do our part. The conference is um, three days. Uh, it'll be September 23rd to the 25th, which is a Friday night, which will be um, a get together activity. Um, Saturday, we'll, we'll have um, presentations. We'll have a couple of um, some really nice talks and lots of little presentations. And we'll have display tables with that we're going to, I'll explain a little bit more, but, um, and we'll have those that want to make a poster with information. Um, we'll have plenty of wall space. So everybody can be involved somehow. Um, so this is what we want you to do. First thing is work on getting your food. That's the most important thing right now, but we've been told that we needed to prayerfully see what the Lord wants us to work on as far as a skill. Um, and as we work on these skills, many of you have skills that can, um, that would be great to share. And this is what we're hoping is that um, everyone can be working on something that they will either help with a committee on a certain subject and and work through it and come up with a handout with uh, good articles, with videos. In fact, um, we're encouraging everyone that's doing research. If you come across a good video, if you will send it to um, on the website, um, there's a place where you can submit these YouTube videos and we're planning to have them online as resources so that as you uh, maybe need some help or some ideas, you can go to the website, look under resources and find uh, videos that people have suggested are good on these different topics. And also the exciting part is that these videos will be saved so that when times maybe there's an EMP and we don't have the internet anymore. These videos will be saved so that we can in the future learn from these videos, which is exciting because I learned so much better with a video than um, any other way. I'm a visual person, but anyway. So um, if you go to, the, to standindependent.com, which is the website for this group, and under it, it says conference 2022. You can click on that and, um, and go through and read and see the different things. But first thing we'd like you to do is to please register if you're, if you're planning to come because we would like to have a number just kind of to plan for handouts, for food, whatever. So if you would register and let us know if you're planning to come and then there's a if you go on down it says keep going please mm -hmm. it says volunteer to help and if you click on that it gives you the some uh topics that if you have interest in one of those or i mean skills skills in one of those you can click whether you have a little skill, medium skill, or a lot of skill. And if you would go through and, and put what you would like to maybe contribute to the conference um, on that, then we have our committee that will get in touch with you and help you know what we need you to do and get you organized with um, others. There, we will, like I said, have um some small presentations 
where for maybe um, 10 to 15 minutes, we're trying to keep them short. So it'll be fun. It'll be interesting because nobody's going to get bored with, you know, long, boring talks. We want, we want this to be fun and we want you to motivate others and try to get them uh, to see how interesting it could be to maybe learn that skill. And so um, we've got lots of different opportunities. There are lots of different things. And if, if on that list, you don't see something that you're really interested in, there's a place to put other. So you can write in, I would like to um, maybe share this on this subject. Also, every, we'll have lots of tables uh, where you could set up a display. And what we're thinking is like, like a science fair, black, um, the backboard, you could put pictures, you could put diagrams, you can put any information. And, um, and then we would like for everyone, as you do research to jot down where you got the information and maybe have a handout that people can take home. So that by the end of this, everyone has a, a little taste of a lot of different things and they can be motivated to get busy with that and on something. And then they'll also have information on papers plus the resource on the website will have all kinds of YouTube videos to go to. The last thing is on Sunday, um, Friday or Saturday will be mostly on physical preparation and Sunday will be on spiritual preparation. And we will have uh, some speakers. And then um, after that, Denver. well, <laughs> Denver has said he would speak. So he'll be there on Sunday. And then um, we're going to have a luncheon <clears throat> afterwards. So anyway, it should be fun. And we hope you'll keep you know checking the website because we will keep you up to date um, if you register we'll send emails out to keep you up to date with what's happening but we'd really like everyone to participate somehow um, we think this will be fun and it'll help us all get together and be prepared so is that okay the end. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful, Melody. Thank you and Terry so much for all of your, your dedicated work. We love you guys. Thank you. Um, just one more announcement uh, before we move forward and turn the time over to McKay. Um, as mentioned earlier, these firesides are going to be held once each month for the next seven months until September uh, when we will we'll have the conference. The next two firesides, uh, the first one being on February 6th, uh, they will be held always on the first Sunday of the month. Um, so February 6th will be on the topic of freeze drying and we've got, uh, we've got a couple of uh, outstanding experts to teach us and show us and talk with us uh, about freeze drying, the, the upsides, the downsides, uh, some do's and don'ts and that kind of thing. And plenty of time for you to ask questions and, and do a little exploring on your own on the topic of freeze drying. Um, and in March, the topic will be presented uh, by Christina uh, and uh, John um, Saunders. And the topic will be water, everything about water, including water purification systems. Uh, so everyone will benefit, we will benefit from that a ton. And we look forward to that in uh, February and then in March, freeze drying and then water. So please join us uh, for those on the first Sunday of each month uh, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. With that, we will turn the time over to our brother McKay Platt 
uh, for uh, tonight's uh, fireside presentation. Okay, thank you, Steve. This will be a short presentation. Um, I'll leave plenty of room for questions. We want to try and answer the question tonight, what are we doing, you know, this Stand Independent Work Group, and why are we doing it? Um, and explain why the food storage effort that uh, comes out of this work group is motivated by a very different view than other preparation efforts. A few facts on prepping. The number of people prepping more than doubled from the beginning of 2020 to, uh, to 2021, according to a survey from uh, Finder. In the last 12 months, uh, roughly 45% of Americans, 115 million people say they spent money preparing or spent money on survival materials. That is way up compared to the previous year where about 20% of Americans, 52 million spent money on these things. Some preppers view food storage as a way for an individual uh, or family to survive a time of societal crash until society rebounds, whether that collapse is general like uh, the Great Depression or local like Katrina. Others imagine food storage as a way to individually survive an apocalyptic collapse like a Mad Max scenario. Others might see food storage in a practical way to extend the buying power of their dollar, buy food when it's cheaper, and then eating it after prices inflate. The consumer price index recently was announced to have jumped 6.8% from the previous year. We're getting some feedback. Um, but food prices for meats, poultry, fish, and eggs went up 12.6% from November of 2020. And inflation is expected to continue through at least the first quarter of this year. Well, Stand Independent uh, Work Group views food storage as a way for a covenant people of God to bridge the time between our current functioning society where you can still secure food and resources between this time and the time when the earth is yielding its bounty and God's covenant people and the new Jerusalem are independent of the surrounding society and culture. And of course, this view requires a few things. It requires that we cooperate and work as a people to store food and supplies to bridge that gap of time and to learn skills of production and harvest of our own food. And of course, all this is, uh, based on an absolute prerequisite of spiritual preparation. Because if we come to the wedding feast without a cloak of charity, well, you know what happened to that guy. Noah's Ark is a uh, loose type. We believe there'll be a time when we must live on what we've prepared. For Noah, it was while traveling from his home to the new place of gathering, and then for some time still living off his supplies until the earth yielded its bounty. For us, we gauge that time that needs to be bridged, measured in years for many things, fruits, nuts, and many meats, months at least for vegetables and grains. This view should inform our food storage and preparation efforts. Now that last boring sentence, may be the most important sentence in this talk. This view should inform and guide our food storage and preparation efforts. Think about that. The website for this effort, standindependent.com, has a page that gives the scriptural rationale for this effort, which I hope to read. It then has a page on storing nearly every kind of food and the advantages and disadvantages of each storage method. I hope you'll use it as a resource. To be successful in this effort, we need to do more than just spend money. We need to understand the reasons why food go bad, which foods go rancid, how long food can store, how to avoid the enemies of food, 
which are heat, oxygen, light, and bugs. And the website can help you answer these questions. The history of this effort goes back about a year. This effort began after Denver Snuffer made some remarks in a small gathering on the need to prepare with stored food until as a people, we can produce everything we need to be quote, independent of the surrounding society and culture that is doomed to fail and to be destroyed. A pub public kickoff in June of last year included a dinner entirely from freeze-dried freeze food and a short talk by Denver, which he called the sermon at the garbage can. We formed a small work group and considered a centralized solution, sort of a bishop's storehouse, but we settled on this as our objective, promoting and assisting individuals and fellowships to prepare food and supplies for a coming day of want. The work of preparation must be individual and in fellowships and families. Our work group hopes to teach, encourage, and facilitate, but the work has got to be done individually. <clears throat> One of the founding ideas we agreed upon in our work group was to focus on preparation out of faith rather than out of fear. There's a relationship between fear and preparation that I want to talk about. Noah prepared the ark out of faith and reverent fear. Here's the quote from Paul. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 39 in the New Covenants. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things as yet as things not yet as seen. Now let's do that again. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not yet as not seen as yet, there we go, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. But in the new American Standard Bible, it reads, by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, not in fear, but in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. The word fear is a translation of a Greek word meaning showing pious care and reverent circumspection. It's translated godly fear in other Bible translations. This is not horror, phobos, or doubt, deos, or panic, ekplexus. If we prepare for things not yet seen out of horror, doubt, or panic, then we are not preparing out of faith and a reverent care over God's warning to us. As the Lord said, but if you are prepared, you need not fear. No need for panic, horror, or doubt if we are prepared. Being prepared absolutely requires spiritual preparation. Let's drill down on that one for a minute. In the answer to prayer for covenant, the Lord said that he would never forsake us, lead us in the path during the troubling season, now fast approaching. I think that was the quote you were looking for, Steve. Raise us up, protect us and abide with us. Gather us in due time and give us a land of promise as our inheritance from him. He also promised to bring peace to us. Peace is not the emotion that inspires bunkers, bug out bags, and bullets. Fear is the opposite of peace. The wicked will not have the Lord's protection and will take up their sword and guns against their neighbor. The unrepentant will not have an inheritance in Zion, and so they may need out of fear to follow the world's false imitation of preparation, which is doomsday prepping. The idolatrous may be required to use their swords and spears and bullets and rifles to barter for food and blankets, but those in Zion will prefer plowshares and pruning hooks. Pruning hooks. And which of us can expect these promises? Do all who enter into the covenant have these promises? My answer is no. Only those who turn from our wicked ways and repent of our evil doings, repent of lying and deceiving, repent of whoredoms and secret, secret abominations, uh, idolatries of murders of priestcraft, of envying and strife, and repent of all wickedness and abominations have come unto Christ and been baptized in his name, 
have received a remission of our sins and received the Holy Ghost. Only those who are spiritually prepared in these ways are numbered with Christ's people according to his words. No one else has the Lord's promise. Thereafter, his people are commanded to teach their children to honor God, seek to recover his lost sheep remnant, care for the poor among us, and lighten one another's burdens. Now I will uh, read the scriptural rationale for this effort. It includes a lot of quotes strung together. This quote is on the web page. There are days of tribulation and a troubling season fast approaching times of extraordinary upheaval. There are great calamities soon to befall the world, a day of trouble, a gathering unto one place has been decreed to prepare the hearts of those gathered and to be prepared in all things against the day of tribulation and desolation sent forth upon the wicked. Preparing the heart has been the focus of our teachers. Physical preparation has not been a focus until just recently. We need to stand independent, that's a quote, of the surrounding society and culture rather than, quote, remain inside a social and cultural construct that is doomed to fail and to be destroyed. Preparing a place of gathering will require many skills lost to urban dwellers, blacksmiths, carpenters, farmers, ranchers, electricians, plumbers and roofers, cultivating what you need to eat, raising animals, having chickens that lay eggs, we were asked to each prayerfully choose a needed skill and learn it, including spinning thread, weaving fabric, producing paper, making cheese, drying fruit and vegetables, beekeeping and egg production. We were told preparing, preparation needs to begin now. That was 2019. How have we done complying with this request? More recently, we were told to learn a trade, cultivating the earth, tending, flocks, forging metal, harvesting lumber, performing carpentry, weaving, sewing, and a thousand needed tasks for surviving and prospering. There are many lost skills which we need to recover. Logically, the need to recover lost skills is because we're gonna need those skills. Can you envision the nature of a society if we needed the lost skills listed above? A post early in 2021 included a focus on, quote, family and provisions to care for them are our only true valuable. From the time the land is in our possession until the land can support its residents will likely be more than a season or two. The average bearing age of fruit trees is for apples four to five years, cherries and plums, three to five years, pears, four to six years. Hence the Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Enriching soil, training plow animals, putting up fences, protecting the animals from predators all takes time. Getting the biggest little farm in balance took seven years. Even with endless labor, the laborers of the land will need to consume their provisions until the land yields its bounty. Well, those are my thoughts. What are yours? Time's yours to talk, comment, ask questions. Thanks for your patience. Knowing uh... Edible plants is important, especially to the region where you live. Uh, I'm pretty good here in the Mojave Desert, but I'm probably not as good as you guys would be in northern Utah. But, uh, you know, the Paiutes, uh, when the Mormons first moved to the Las Vegas Valley in 1856, by the way, it was my great, great, great grandfather. William Bringhurst, who did that. Uh, there were 2,000 Paiute Indians living in the Las Vegas Valley. And if you imagine a desert like this was, uh, it's hard to imagine that 2,000 Paiute Indians lived here, but they did, and they ate uh, edible plants. So that would be a, a good start right there. I suspect that will be one of the topics in the fall conference coming up. We've had one person express 
an interest in teaching us uh, about that very subject, Alan? Unfortunately, it's uh, very geographically limited. Uh, you know, like I said, I could uh, possibly show people what to eat here in uh, the Las Vegas Valley and in the surrounding Mojave Desert and elsewhere. But, uh, you know, a lot of this depends on the geography where you're at. I'm sure that things are a little bit different in Montana. In I other words, what I, I'm saying is, is that, that that kind of information is a little bit more site specific rather than uh, general. There's quite a few plants <coughs> that are pretty general over the whole United States, and those would be really important to learn because we don't know exactly where we'll be, but there are quite a few that are pretty much found everywhere. So those would be good to learn. At one point in this uh, work group, I expressed the frustration that we're trying to prepare, but we don't know what for, we don't know when, we don't know how long, and we don't know where. It would be helpful to know where. Well, the where would help certainly with pre-positioning uh, supplies. Uh, such as uh, backhoes and gasoline and graders and trench diggers and all of the things that you need to basically put sewer systems in and roads and all of that good kind of stuff. But until that, until we know where, there's no way that pre-positioning of anything can take place. And this kind of stuff is typically very heavy. Food is very heavy. If you've ever been in an elders quorum where you moved somebody into a from one apartment to the other and moved all of their food storage, that is a pain in the patoot. That will find uh, that uh, that's one of the major benefits of freeze drying food. Although there's some capital costs involved up front that could be prohibitive for some, um, that you end up removing 90 plus percent of the water content of the food that you freeze dry. And so uh, today we distributed in our fellowship uh, five large totes full of bags of freeze dried food. And in total, uh, those five totes probably represented maybe, maybe 100 pounds. I doubt it, but maybe. And so uh, freeze-dried foods end up being very mobile, uh, easy to move, highly, highly nutritious, and we'll hear more about that next, next month. Water, on the other hand, extremely difficult to uh, both store and move, um, and so it's going to be an interesting discussion about water, and, and I would I would point out that Denver has, has suggested that same thing, that water, water purification is going to be, is going to be a huge deal. It's going to be a big, big deal for us to figure out and implement. So McKay, um, you know that Angela and I are interested in the housing aspect of this because Denver's post a year ago. It talked about uh, Lehi taking his provisions, which included a tent and food. Um, <clears throat> has any thought been given by the committee to having any discussions around that? Because let's face it, there's gonna be um, a need, at least even for temporary housing, let's assume you um, <clears throat> go somewhere and, and if it's a desert, like, uh, what people are, you know, what the scriptures are saying and what the prophecies say, you're gonna have to have some temporary housing where, where until you can build more permanent housing. Um, and you know, Angie and I are keen on that, but <clears throat> and I had heard maybe Reed could speak up, but I read I'd heard that uh, you were planning on uh, maybe uh, getting a hold of some mobile homes or something with solar panels. Is that is that true? 
Uh, so not mobile homes with solar panels, no. Uh, uh, what we are doing is uh, building solar power generators, big okay. ones uh, that are capable of producing uh, 5,600 watts. In other words, 5.6 kilowatts per hour per trailer. And these are all with brand new state-of-the-art components, 24 kilowatt battery system on board, um, 12 kilowatt uh, pure sine wave inverter that will surge to 36 kilowatts so that it will uh, be available for 120 or 240 volt uh, tools and construction and lights and, and running well pumps and Everything you could imagine that, that needs to be done by electrical power, uh, we're hoping to be able to power. Uh, and because it's on a mobile platform, you can just take it and drop it anywhere in the western half of the U.S. within 24 hours or less and be under construction. So th this is not like finding old mobile homes or anything of that nature. We're actually buying the finest components that we can find anywhere in the world, the best panels, the best batteries, the best uh, inverters and other, and having them built, um, purpose built specifically for this project. And uh, so that, I, I, does that answer your question? I mean, I, I threw out a bunch of stats, but let me, for those of you that aren't familiar with electricity and all that, uh, it's enough to power your house, you know, one trailer. So, so, so the trailer isn't meant to be lived in, it's just to house the battery uh, packs and the solar cells. That's right. Is it? Okay. Yeah, and it can haul additional um, gear within the trailer. The trailer's like a flatbed trailer that has panels mounted on it and has all the other gear uh, so that you could load it up and take it with you and you could take it up the mountains. It could power your RV. It could power a secondary residence. You could power your primary residence. It could. It's a great you know, idea. All those things. Uh, what we hope to do, to be real clear, is uh, we hope to be able to sell these, you know, to interested parties around the country. And uh, for every two or so that we sell and build, we hope to be able to net or retain enough cash to be able to build a third one and that third one will go into a fleet and the fleet will be set aside and then ready to deploy as soon as we have the green light to uh, begin construction great Fantastic. Kevin, you uh, directed the first part of that question to me i'll respond this way the stand independent group is um was set up to address one issue that's food storage and uh, a, a storage of food and supplies um not everything uh like housing so there was another effort uh concerted what was the name of that group concerted uh, effort. concerted effort yeah concerted effort uh and uh, i i don't know how active that group is now but I've re we've reached out to them and encouraged them to, uh, you know, merge with our effort so that we have lost skills uh, addressed at this conference, including building. And I know there's a number of people working on uh, different building techniques, but it's not part of this um, stand independent work group yet. It sounds like you're trying to, and I think rightly so, to just kind of converge uh, in something bigger than just uh, food food storage. Is that right? It'd be great to have one single resource people could look at for for everything yeah. for, uh, related to preparedness. When uh, when this initiative began um, more than a year ago, it, it, as uh, McKay pointed out it was the impetus for the original inspiration uh, came from a presentation that, that uh, Denver gave uh, at a cabin up near Oakley, Utah. And, and not to be crude or, or crass or 
anything like that. The, the theme of Denver's discussion was, please, please bear with me. What are we going to do with our shit? What are we going to do with our poop? And, and from that discussion, uh, there was a lot that came out with respect to what is it really that, that we're going to face as a people? What is it really that, that we need to prepare for? Well, one of those things is what are we going to do with our, with our human waste? Um, but, but as a part of that discussion, it came out that there's going to be a period of time and it wasn't, you know, uh, specifically defined, but the suggestion was that it could be a number of years, a number of seasons, as McKay pointed out, uh, where, where this people will not be, cannot be self-sufficient. And so, and so what is, how do you deal with that fact? If, if we're not going to be prepared to care for ourselves for a number of years, how do we deal with that? What, what is it we need to do? Uh, given that the Lord has told us to be prepared, prepare every needful thing. I can probably answer that for you. <clears throat> so uh, I've actually done a lot of studying on what to do with that. And uh, the number one cause of death uh, and problems in a state of emergency is uh, just that situation. It's medicinal. You can do without a lot of things, but that will take you down faster than anything will because it carries the disease. So the best thing to do is to uh, build bins and you have a uh, just a regular little old plastic bucket that you can poop into and uh, you just throw a little leaf or sawdust over it to keep the smell and uh, smell down. And if you can get a hold of some pallets and some hay or straw or leaves or anything that's you know, will decompose like that. And you pour that in there and you keep it covered up. It has a natural uh, thing in it where just the production of that will uh, heat up to the point that it kills all bacteria in the human waste. And that after about a year, uh, you can actually take that, tear it back down and actually put that out in your gardens without it being a problem. And so, uh, you can just continue that cycle over and over and over. And uh, I haven't tried it, but I have collected all the items to do that, even right here in Apple Valley, Utah, uh, just for that reason. And uh, went down to Walmart, picked up some crummy little $3 buckets with the lids. And so what you do is you have uh, basically what would you would consider a little uh, composting toilet. Uh, you just have a little bucket, make a little seat over the top of it. And uh, if you're going to do it and keep it in the house, then what you want to do is throw a little hay or straw or sawdust over it. Uh, that keeps the smell down. And if you're going to do it outside, then the main problems, of course, is flies. And so by covering it up <clears throat> after you've used it and you throw a little sawdust over it or whatever you, whatever you have, that keeps the bugs and the flies out. So uh, there is an answer to that. And... Uh, I've been doing some studying on that, and that was kind of what the Lord showed me how to do, go about do that. Now, that. now, this isn't just something that's just come about. This has been going on for a long, long time. And there's lots of people that are out there that literally don't even use flush toilets anymore because it uses so much water. If so, I can interrupt here, too. Uh, you bet. Go ahead. You know, I currently live in a house that used to have a septic tank in it. And, you know, it was built in the 1950s. I live in Salt Lake County. And it was converted to the sewer once the sewer was put in here. So, you know, you also think, you know, what the pioneers did was build outhouses and, you know, they dug deep holes uh, for the waste to go down into. But, um, you know, septic tanks are pretty efficient and there's still a lot of places rural places right now that don't have sewage systems and they are on septic tanks and you know that's another possible solution too and i don't think they're that difficult to construct and maintain and stuff 
Uh, you know, I, also, I also wanted to point out on the building aspect, you know, I know that there's myself included, I'm a general contractor and I've been in the building trades for 40 years. And I know that there's several other <clears throat> people that are in the building trades that are part of what we're doing here. But then again, <clears throat> what are we faced with? Are we going to be building homes out of sod and or are we going to have access to timber? I mean, what material are we going to have for building? It's so difficult to prepare. You know, you personally, know, I've been trying to accumulate just a lot of tools that are related to building and, and hopefully, you know, can bring those along if I, you know, should happen to uh, <clears throat> be found worthy to be invited. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. The uh, if, it's if it's could. it's interesting that uh, pointing up a subject uh, leads to this kind of discussion, and and what it really points up, brothers and sisters, is that there are literally ten thousand issues that need to be addressed, um, just like the issue about what do we do with our waste, and so. Um, you know, this, this uh, group, this work group that came together uh, to uh, initially hope that we could talk about preparing all things that are going to be needful for our, us and our families. Uh, we've had to narrow it down kind of, kind of just out of necessity to the issue of food first. But you need to understand that you and your family are going to need a toothbrush. <laughs> You're going to need some soap. You're going to need some, uh, some disinfectant of some kind. You're going to need medical supplies. Um, and, and is food important? Food and water are, are of first importance. But, but once those are, are tended to and taken care of, uh, there is so much more that our families uh, will need. And so uh, McKay's right, we're focusing at this moment on food because it's, it's, uh, it's pertinent that it be that way um, because food and water will allow you to carry on and without it, you won't carry on. Um, but there are many, 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 many issues that any one of you could grab a hold of and, and take off with uh, and, and organize around and come up with answers for this people. If, if I could, I, I think that maybe some perspective is, might be in order, at least by my way of thinking. Uh, right now, I understand the population of the Earth is approximately 8 billion. Uh, if you go back 150 years, uh, the population of the Earth was maybe a billion, if that. Um, what are the seismic changes that allowed such a huge increase in the population? Well, the internal combustion engine. Uh, Edison's light bulb, a whole bunch of different inventions and so on and so forth, electricity and stuff. But remember that for millennia, people were living without electricity, without internal combustion engines, without even fertilizer and without uh, uh, the medicines that we know from our pharmaceutical companies right now. Uh, I think that McKay had it right when he said something to the effect that we need to gain, regain some lost skills. In other words, skills that my great, great, great grandpa had when uh, he moved into the Las Vegas Valley and was able to survive uh, that we don't have right now. And I think that that's important. Uh, if we, if we, you know, I, I understand Reed's uh, uh, desire to maybe have some electricity at this place and it probably would be helpful if we're building a, a, a sewer system uh, to have a backhoe or a trench digger or something like that. But uh, I'm not so sure that we can count on it. What we can count on is, is acquiring those lost skills. And those lost skills involved a lot, a lot of things 
uh, that Lehi probably had when he left Jerusalem for the uh, Arabian desert, I'm presuming, uh, that we probably don't know about. Um, for example, where do you find water? And then if you find it, how do you know whether you need to treat it or not? I, of course, I do a lot of hiking and mountain climbing and stuff, and I think that I have a pretty good idea about that. But finding water in the desert is not an easy thing. Uh, it's a skill that you have to know and you have to know the terrain and where to look. Uh, but these are lost skills. And I think that McKay, by, by mentioning that term lost skills, how do you do it? How does a, how does a person in a prairie schooner going along the Oregon Trail uh, going through Idaho and on into the into Oregon's Willamette Valley and its virgin forest, how does he turn that into um, a farm uh, without starving in the meantime? They did that. Our ancestors did that. Of course, that first year or four, as the people in the Salt Lake Valley knew about the crickets and all that good kind of stuff, uh, learned really fast is yeah, those first years before fruit trees and the, and the land is productive and all of that kind of stuff, people, are, people just might starve. How do we get those lost skills to develop that thing back? And I think that that's where we probably ought to put the focus. It would be great if we could have electricity, but I'm sure, you know, 150 years ago, they certainly weren't counting on that. And I'm not so sure that we could count on it this time around either with all due respect so, can anybody hear me can can you hear me yes okay so um we started this preparation seven years ago and um i just wanted to, <laughs> touch it, to like comment on a, on a few things first of all alan is right we, we probably won't have electricity unless we make it and even if we can make it unless we have more components to be able to uh, fix uh, pieces as they break down um, it will be temporary and so seven years ago when I started thinking about this it was a bit overwhelming because I thought oh my gosh every aspect that we live in is Babylon and so I started just taking one aspect at a time it's like okay it's great to store um, soap or toothpaste but ultimately i need to know how to make it and so there are some things that we if we cannot make something or we cannot grow something then we have to figure out an alternative for instance um <clears throat> like this is, seems like really kind of dumb but coffee take coffee i can't grow coffee beans and so either i have to store enough for my fix or I have to not have coffee. I have to figure out something else, which you can, you can actually cook barley and bake it and you can have kind of that earthy taste that you want and do it. And so where we live, there are people who actually live power free and toilet free. And so I, I saw Sam Bowman say something about uh, humanure, which it sounds gross, but I have a friend who actually does that and they have three stalls because it takes two years to um, to compost humanure. And um, anyway, you just keep taking it in there, but with food, so this was standing independent is about food. Freeze drying is great. I do freeze drying, I do canning, I do dehydrating. Um, and I think it might be wise, first of all, to realize that if we have a shortage of water and that's tough, that freeze drying doesn't always require water. You can eat some of the things without it, but a lot of it you do need re to reconstitute. And so we've been trying to have a variety of all of it. Um, to make bread, you can't really freeze dry bread well because you can't reconstitute it with water. And so you need to be able to know how to sprout your grains and, and grind them and grow them. And so, um, you know, I was just, one of the things that we do that we've also considered is if we are going to be independent, like we might have a Home Depot or a Lowe's now or for a season, but there won't be. And so what, what would the first, you know, few families or whatever that is there have a Babylon house with sheetrock and 
all of these other sorts of things and then what happens to the others that come how can we replicate and duplicate our efforts unless we've learned how to do it without the world and so um it is so much work you know to have sheep to shear them to wash the wool to card the wool to um grow the food to process the food um to use the food and then some of the things i find is that there are so many um, opinions about food storage and there really are some unsafe food um, practices that can actually harm us if we don't do it right and um, they were right freeze drying is the most healthy it does have the best life i'm not discounting that at all it's a fantastic option but we still have to have breads we still have to be able to have um, you know, one benefit of canning food is, ha is having the liquid. And so there's all those trains of thoughts, but I don't know. I think, you know, one of the things that I appreciated that McKay said was that <clears throat> we really actually have no promise that we get to be there unless we actually are living the covenant and that we have that promise. And I just, I just feel like our effort does have to be spiritual and physical preparation at the same time. So anyway, thanks. There's yeah. a lot more I could say about just a, a quick comment. Oh, I, no, I just Alan, put on the Alan, hold on, please. Daniel's had his hand up for about 15 minutes. Please go ahead, Daniel. So I was thinking of a couple of things. Um, the only scriptural thing in the book of Mormon regarding the exodus of a people, um, it really comes to mind in regards to preparing is the brother of Jared and what they prepared in advance mm -hmm. and Lehi and his family. And if the Book of Mormon is a keystone for our day, there might be lessons and application for it. There was an eight year period, if I recall correctly, where the Lord helped prepare Bountiful for their arrival. And they needed certain things in the meantime. And then there was the bounty and Bountiful that helped and it was a blessing from the Lord. And so there is indeed a period of time. Um, when I think of building the city, one of the thoughts that comes to mind is when there is a call to start building a new Jerusalem, I believe there will also be a call to build a temple when the Lord has a people prepared to do that step. There might be an interim between the two, but when there is a call to build a temple to the Lord, when we had the saints in Joseph's days doing so, we learned that in Nauvoo, the community built many buildings, including many of their own personal houses. And their own personal houses were something that probably took considerable time and effort to build their nest. Brick houses, nice brick houses maybe even. It, there was a lot of effort diverted from the building of the temple <laughs> to the building of the community. I don't profess to have answers and to know how to proceed. But if Lehi was able to take something and live in something of a tent nature for eight years, while the Lord prepared a place in preparation to provide the food for them in Bountiful, despite the fact that he had the skills, rather than see a repeat of Nauvoo, Illinois, where, okay, we have a temple, but we also need homes, and we need homes before winter, so maybe we can donate one time in 10 to the building of the temple, while the rest of the time is built on our farms and our homes and building it and trying to help one another and building the community. The thought that I like, um, that I think that I would try to put into place is to say, the food, the water and the sewer, but I wanna make sure that if I'm participating that I have enough time to participate in what I believe would be the first priority which is to get a temple. Because if you can get a community that have a temple where the Lord can actually come and visit to, the glory, the intelligence, and the blessings, and the protection that can be provided that community would probably far outpace uh, the alternative. So when it comes to building your own house, the current structure we have in regards to Western civilization, just like Nancy was saying, a lot of those things we might not have available for a long period of time. I expect there are alternatives that are more earthy, more natural, and using natural resources, or 
a self-sacrifice and something that you can bring up ahead of time and living in a yurt or something of the temporary nature that can still be of a permanent residence for years, at least until the <clears throat> core, the center of the community upon which everything else is to be focused and organized can be implemented. And then there would be plenty of time, I believe, to go into a more permanent structure of a housing. But that's a thought that I wanted to present and said, you know, put on other people's hard drives for consideration in regards to if you're wanting to be there, how am I going to prepare? Trying to prioritize prayerfully with the Lord and determine just to what degree of housing do you really need comfort wise, structure wise, uh, first as a priority, as opposed to some of the other things we might face. Can I just say something really cool? There. Can I just say something really? There we go. Okay. I would like to just say something on the website. If you go under, um, what's it called? Suggested skills to study. There's a long list of things and down a ways it says lost skills and down under construction and building or something. Um, where is it? Anyway, there's a lot of things on YouTube uh, videos about earth homes and um, rammed earth where you build homes with dirt. Um, it, 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 you mix it with sand and, and uh, some clay or you know, things like that. It tells you how to do it. But literally there are homes all over the world that are made out of dirt and um, on one of the videos, it says that they've lasted for a thousand years over in um, like India or some of those places. They're literally out of dirt. And if that's all we've got is dirt, we can make homes out of that if we learn how to do it. So if you go to Law Skills, read through the list, there might be things that just like McKay um, suggested on the email, what was it, McKay? It was um, those uh, things that you put in the ground. Oh, oh, something. Anyway, I didn't know what it was, so I looked it up because I saw a, something that I didn't know what it was. I looked it up online, and it's amazingly interesting, and it's like, wow, we, we really need to learn to do these things. So go to that list, look through things. If there's something you don't understand what it is, look it up because... There are a lot of lost skills that are would be very helpful to know. So. Can I go ahead and say something? Everybody good with that? Okay. Yep. So here's some thoughts to really think. First of all, uh, no matter what we do or how we get there, from everything I understand, um, I don't think we'll be going in luxury by any way, shape, or form. But I will tell you this, the first key thing is without water, you're dead in three or four days. Without shelter, depending on the temperatures outside, you might last a night. And after that, if you're lucky enough to have food, then you need to dispose of it correctly or that will be our demise right there. Now, I have faith that no matter how much I prepare, whatever I am to leave with, should I be lucky enough to go to one of these places of refuge? It will be like a refuge camp at the beginning. I don't think there'll be any luxury whatsoever, but we also need to remember that the Lord prepares this way for us we're called to go this direction if we'll listen. And I truly believe in my heart that whatever we need to sustain our lives here, to do the Lord's work, that he will help in that process. And I go back to if he needs to crack a rock, if he needs to have a deer stroll into camp and fall over dead, if he needs to create a uh, drop manna from the skies, uh, whatever that might be, we're going to need that support from him. We cannot prepare enough. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a prepared freak. 
I, I have solar. My house is a geothermal setup. I understand rammed earth homes as she talked about. I've studied earth ships, how to build homes out of earth and timber and just simple supplies. Uh, my grandfather left me all his hand tools. That's cool. To be able to even create a home of some sort. But I don't think we're going to see sheetrock and insulation. Uh, these are going to have to be uh, things that are close by. And it'll have to be the stuff that's available to us. And there's plenty of dirt, kids. So bring gloves because you're going to get your fingernails dirty. But even that doesn't go up overnight. And I will tell you, I went down. I'm really doing it good. I went down and bought some nice brand new nylon tents to camp out and head to Zion in. We threw one up in the middle of winter time and it didn't even last the night. It was shredded. The wind was so bad. So if you're going to get a tent, I would consider canvas. Another thing is that's wrong with like a nylon is I took one of my brand new nylon tents. I set it outside for about six weeks in the middle of summer for the kids to just go out and stay. It disintegrated. The sun just rotted it. And so I believe we're all going to start with something like that. It will be a tent. So if you're going to get a tent, at least get one that may have some value to it. And those are just my experiences. And the medicinal, you can look anywhere in the world right now. And, uh, you know, they take the, the little plastic tanks, uh, poopers out there for them, and they dig holes in the ground. And let me tell you, they're a mess. It is completely unsanitary, and it is the cause of most of the deaths in these areas. So uh, a feasible way of disposing the human waste is key. And I think uh, Melody, is that what I said? She touched on that. Uh, she's got that right. Uh, we'll have to, uh, well, like I was trying to explain how to get rid of it. It is recyclable and you can use it in your gardens. And it is a process, but um, I am well adverse to that. And apparently there's a few other too. And I can, I, uh, I have a septic system in my house. I've put septic systems in, but it takes a lot of work. And it takes a ton of digging and there's a lot of cost in it. It's not cheap or inexpensive. I'm talking about just gathering together a few pallets and some straw or hay or leaves and uh, someone bring a toilet seat. We're all going to be using it. <laughs> so See, I, I have this big book, a uh, big thick book about teepees from various different tribes in uh, North America. And it is fascinating how strong and uh, the ingeniousness of, of those teepees, those things can take wind like nothing else. Uh, yurts uh, in Mongolia, uh, good grief, those things uh, are pretty hard to blow down and uh, just about any uh, tent that you could buy in any store these days uh, are not really going to last that long. So yurts and uh, and teepees are really, really good ideas. Uh, that book that I have uh, uh, that's about two inches thick about uh, teepees uh, might come in handy someday. Uh, and just uh, one other note, uh, uh, I'm kind of one of those masochist kind of guys who climb big mountains and uh, have lived weeks on end, maybe even month uh, on freeze dried and man, it gets tiresome really fast. I like the idea about teepees. Good suggestion. And the Indians survived on this continent for centuries using those. We could certainly do justice to them to learn how to do that ourselves. I think that some of the things that often get overlooked when you're looking in, because it's not just food storage that's going to matter. You know, you guys brought up poop, but how are you going to wipe your butt? And a lot of people say, oh, I'm just going to use a leaf or something. Well, if you've got mullen around, it's pretty good, but mullen's probably better used medicinally than wiping your butt. So if there are things that, like we have been making toilet paper out of flannel and you know preparing for these sheets and then if you have squirt bottles you can squirt your butt just wipe it dry so that you're not wiping the poop onto the thing and then wash it and for any of one who is old like us I had cloth diapers for my first babies and you know used to scrape the poop off before I washed it anyway so I mean it's you know not a foreign thing if if you uh, have actually done something like that but 
there's a lot of aspects that is going to make life a lot better. Um, if you can think of those things. So every single time you do anything, if you start changing your mindset and saying, oh, I'm brushing my teeth with a toothbrush. How am I going to not do this if I can't go to Walmart and buy this? Oh, I am washing dishes. How can I make dish soap or how am I going to have cloth or how am I going to do this? And, you know, there was a time um, when I just got so overwhelmed, it was so depressing. And I just spent a lot of time in prayer and I feel much more like I'm going to be able to do what I can do. And I'm, I'm of the same opinion as Kevin that or I think it was him that said it, that we're going to have to have some heavenly help. But I think that it's a grave mistake to count on the heavenly help without us doing all that we can possibly do ourselves first. Amen, Nancy. Amen, I agree. Hey, uh, just let me jump in here. There are a lot of people on this call that haven't had a chance to speak up yet. would love to have some of the people who haven't spoken yet to go ahead and unmute and tell us what you're thinking. Now's your chance. Reed, we, uh, can you hear me, Reed? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we have about 13 minutes, uh, and we will have been an hour and a half, which is kind of what we told people. So if no one wants to say anything at this juncture, um, uh, or uh, we have another 13 minutes on the other hand, we could either wrap up right now, call on someone to say a closing prayer and, uh, and let everyone get about their business, uh, whatever everyone would like to do, but we, we, we have about 13 minutes left. I'd like to say something. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we go hear ahead. you, Gary. Uh, as far as we ought to have someone, and I thought of doing it. You can grow microgreens, and you can grow them in ten days if they have the light on them, and and of course from warmth. You can do it inside of a trailer with a electrical power or electrical generator, and you can grow great uh, microgreens enough to feed a lot of people very easily. You won't necessarily have to scavenge all over the mountainside to get vegetables when you can grow them so quickly. If you just get the seeds for them. I think you could do a sprouts too very easily. Get the greens you need if you have the basic food. Um, this is Louie. I have thought if anybody cares. Can you hear me? Yeah, hear go ahead, Lou. Lou. Yep. Um, so here, a thought is we may have a little bit of time here. And if you were to say, let's say we found out where it was tomorrow. I said, okay, it's out there, but it's six hours away from the closest Costco. It's two hours or three hours away from the closest Home Depot. But you've still got time. Who would you want? What What would you need to start setting up there? I mean, these are normal skills that I would think if I were going to pick a group of people, I think my first guy would be somebody who can get me honey, for example. I mean, it's not I, I don't know that we're going to have to go be thrown back into the 18th century. In fact, I think God will bless us and, and, and nurture us along. It's sort of like calves in a stall. But some of those things, rather than theoretically, um, hey, in case there's a mad rush, we should bail into the mountainside. You know, maybe it's smarter for us to start right now doing something that could double up. If somebody can make that sourdough bread out of the stuff, they, the expensive stuff in the store that you can make out of um, just wheat, salt and water and have it. I mean, for me, I can live pretty damn well on some sourdough bread and, and honey 
and a few other little things. I mean, it's kind of simple things where we don't have to stretch our weight clear out. Everybody could uh, ferment some sourdough. Not everybody could do bees, but it's a lot less capital up front. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's all I'm thinking is I, I too have thought my whole life about the extreme stuff and it have even done wilderness survival, primitive survival camps with nothing but a knife and a seat belt and whatever. But I don't, um, my gut is we'll have more time. God's going to, but we will have to have some basic skills that we could develop now while Home Depot is open and not just, you know, theoretically we're going to have be living out in the middle of um, mud, mud nowhere. That's all. And yes, locust and right. I got you, Nicole. I'll eat locusts with my honey. All right. Um, no one else is going to go forward. I'm going to say something. <clears throat> We've been uh, on this journey for several years. And recently we've been um, trying to understand how to turn rocks into bread in a quite literal sense. Rocks um, turn into soil. It's the foundation of life. Um, and it's kind of an interesting, you know, um, uh, analogy of our hard hearts, which can be seen as rocks and it's going to be turned into something useful. Um, and, and, you know, as we've been researching and, and kind of delving into some of these, you know, independent, indefinite kind of ideas and skills, the answers are already out there. The Gentiles have a lot of answers, but so do the Orientals, so do the Native Americans, so do all of these other cultures in their practices, whether it's in birth, whether it's in life, <clears throat> whether it's in death. Um, and I think part of seeking after the lost sheep isn't just, um, you know, spiritual in a sense, but it's also temporal. And so I, I, you know, I just, I guess, encourage everyone to, to think about it in a, in a holistic kind of truth is circumscribed, circumscribed into one great whole. And let's, let's figure out how to turn rocks into bread. Or get used to eating manna if the Lord is uh, kind enough to send it to us. Hopefully it tastes really good. I imagine it would. You know, the Lord is the baker of that, and I'm sure he's a good baker. Again, I, I just want to, you know, say that our ancestors lived for thousands and thousands of years without all of the electronic gadgets that we have and without jet engines and without all of this kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we take our electronics uh, way too seriously and uh, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, we probably would be, you know, uh, pretty wise to uh, figure out uh, those lost skills as, uh, as McKay put it and uh, try to do it. I think that Nancy's got a good thing going up in uh, Northern Idaho. I Certainly, she's been experimenting, and uh, I'm sure she's a font of knowledge. But uh, you know, you 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 uh, take things off of the land, you take things um, as you can get them, and uh, you know, and who knows, maybe a flock of quail will come our way. So you know, you never know about those things. Reed, do you mind, does anyone mind now if we, uh, if we assign uh, or look for a volunteer for a closing prayer and, and uh, close this uh, fireside? I think the discussion's been awesome. I've been, uh, I, I found myself interested in, in everything that's been said. And uh, 
I think uh, what I take away from this is that there's much, much, much to do, much to be done. And uh, we don't need to do it in haste. Uh, we should remember, perhaps as a closing note, that this is not our work. This is the Lord's work. This will be his city, his New Jerusalem, his Zion. And, and if we are humble enough and meek enough to simply um, listen to his voice and respond in faith, it will be faith uh, that the Lord needs from us more than any other thing. Just faith. Hear and obey. Is there a volunteer to give us a closing prayer for those who are left on the call with us? Someone please volunteer to, to say a word of prayer for us, closing. I'll volunteer. Nancy volunteers. Okay. <clears throat> Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the abundance of blessings that thou hast given us. And we're grateful that we get to live at this time and see, oh, so many prophecies being fulfilled and hopefully see the things that are yet to come. And we ask you to please help us as we strive to exit Babylon and to become a people worth preserving, that we might be inspired that we might have your spirit be poured out upon us that we will have a clear um, knowledge of what we individually need to do to prepare that we might be an instrument in your hands for good we're thankful for all of the things that you have given us so far and we just ask you truly father to be with us that we might be able to rise up and um, we ask for protection upon everybody and Help us that we can learn the skills that would be helpful to a group of people because we certainly can't do everything all by ourselves and that together we can be a greater whole. And we ask for this, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your preparation for all of this. Thank you, brother. Talk with everyone later. Good night.